My name is Sam and I'm a real estate investor. I own a house buying company that flipped 252 houses in 2021. I also own a $40 million rental portfolio that I've been able to buy without using any of my own money. So I eat, breathe, and sleep real estate. I talk about the Burrs method all the time. It stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and scale. And it is how I have built massive wealth in a short period of time without using any of my own money. But the most complicated step of that process is that refinance step. It's the most complicated step in that process. I'm gonna give you three tips so that when you refinance your properties, you're gonna get all your money back. And number three is a secret tip that not many people know and not many people do when they're utilizing the Burrs method. Simply put, the Burrs method is a way to buy rental properties without using any of your own money. And the key to that is that refinance step. That refinance step allows you to pay off your short-term lenders and get into long-term low rate financing so you can buy it and own it all without using any of your own money. I own apartment complexes, single family rentals, and storage facilities, all with this method, so it's powerful. Stay tuned to the end so you can hear Maisie's joke of the day, and also, I'm gonna explain to you why debt to income ratio does not matter at all when you're dealing with the Burrs method and doing it the right way. Because a lot of people think, I don't make enough money to borrow more money. It doesn't matter if you're doing it the way I'm gonna tell you. In the next 10 seconds, I'm going to describe the Burrs method up to the refinance. You buy a property at a discount that's distressed using somebody else's money. You fix it up and get it rent ready using that same person's money. Then you get the property rented. Guess what? That person who lent you the money to buy it and fix it up did not do it for free. You have to pay them back plus interest. That's where the refinance step comes into play. The refinance step is an 80% cash out refinance. Small local banks, which we'll get into here in a minute, these banks, they will lend you up to 80% of the value of a property. Most people think I had to put 20% down on my rental property so that a bank will lend me the money. That's not the case. The bank doesn't care about that 20%. They don't even usually take that 20%. They just want you to have at least 20% equity in the property. Either you put in cash into it or bringing them a deal at below market value, which is what the Burrs method is, which allows you to not use any of your own money. And it's a cashier's check. They hand you a cashier's check for up to 80% of what the property is worth. Then you take that cashier's check and you pay back your initial lender, that one who lent you the money to purchase that distressed property and fix it up. You give them their money back plus interest with that 80% cash out refinance check. The bank didn't just give you that check, that's a mortgage now, and you pay that over 25, 30 years at a very low interest rate. So then you don't have to actually come out of pocket once you own it. So that's kind of how it works in a nutshell. Let's go over a couple quick examples of the refinance, and then let's go over those three tips. Let's say your property is worth $300,000 and appraises for $300,000. A bank will literally write you a check for up to 80% of that or $225,000. So assuming you bought a property and fix it up for less than $225,000, the bank will give you that check for 225, you take it and pay off the initial lender plus interest. A question a lot of people have is what if it doesn't appraise for enough to pay back my initial lender plus interest and have to come out of pocket? While that is a possibility, these next three steps will make it not an option. If you're still watching this video and you have not hit that like button, do that now, please. I would appreciate it. It helps the channel. It helps get this information out to more people and it just makes me feel good. And it can make you feel good because that confetti pops around that thumbs up once you hit it. Number one, run extremely conservative numbers. When you're looking at purchasing a property, a lot of people get emotional, they get drawn up, especially in their first couple deals, and they really, really wanna make a deal work and they let emotion take over the numbers and you cannot do that, especially on your first couple deals. So what do I mean by run conservative numbers? I mean, if you think the property is going to be worth $250,000 once it's fixed up because you saw other fixed up properties that have sold in that area that sold for around that price, that's okay to think that, but don't run your numbers on that. Run your numbers at 230 or maybe 240. Just be conservative on what your property is going to be worth or what you think it's gonna be worth. You will be happy you did. Now, maybe you won't buy as many properties. That's okay. If you think it needs a $40,000 rehab, put 45 or $50,000 in the rehab. What you're doing is you're building buffers for when things probably will go wrong, especially on your first few deals. So if the property is really worth 250 and you run it at 240, and it really needs 40, but you run it at $50,000 rehab, that gives you $20,000 
to screw up or to have something unforeseen go wrong or to take longer on the rehab, whatever it is, just be conservative. Your future self will thank you. That takes discipline. That takes getting emotion out of it, but it is extremely important. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people push that ARV. They say it's going to be worth 260 when it's really worth 250. They know the rehab's $40,000, but they put in $30,000 because they think that they can cut corners and make it work. Be conservative. Your future self will thank you. Number two, make sure to go to small local banks. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but do not go to your big box banks, your Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Commerce Bank. Those banks don't want anything to do with these type of loans. I'm going to explain why here in a second, but you need to go to these small local community banks like First State Bank of St. Charles or this county bank. There's these small little community banks. There's usually maybe three to 10 branches. They're in big cities. They're on the outskirts of big cities. They're in small towns. They are everywhere and they are in business to lend to real estate investors like you and me. They're not in business to do thousands of residential loans. They're not in business to have billions of depository accounts. Those are how Bank of America stays in business and makes a crap ton of money. They take your loan and they sell it on the secondary market to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So they have all these rules and regulations and boxes they have to check. So they don't wanna deal with investment properties. They don't wanna deal with distressed properties. They don't wanna deal with rental properties. They have billions of dollars in depository accounts that they make a little spread on that are in their bank that they lend out. And they also deal with residential mortgages and just sell them off and make a little money. These small local banks don't have that luxury. So they want to do business with you. No, they don't want to do business with you. They have to do business with you or people like you to stay in business. So that's how it works. That's when banks were decentralized, you know, what, 30, 40 years ago, this is kind of one of those things that happen. These small local banks have their own rules. They have their own laws. Of course, they can't break any federal law. They have way more flexibility than these big banks because it's the owner you're talking to. It's a person. It's not some huge corporate publicly traded company with a million CEOs all making $10 million a year. It's a small local bank. It's a community focused bank that is focused in the community that lives and works in the community. And also, like I said, they don't sell their mortgages off. They don't have all these government rules and regulations to sell them to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. They hold them in-house, so they have a lot of flipping flexibility on what they can do. I've been blown away by what small local banks have done for me after I've started to develop a relationship with them. Number three, and this is kind of a pro tip and something that not a lot of people do. When you take your property to a small local bank, you're going to buy it using somebody else's money, you're going to fix it up, and then you're going to get it rented, and then you're going to call the small local bank and say, hey, I have this property rented, I have it fixed up. Up, I am ready to do an 80% cash out refinance. And they will say, okay, we're going to send out a third party appraiser. The appraiser is going to tell us the market value of the property. That's how banks do it. They're not in the business to tell you the value of the property. So they hire a third party appraiser to go out and say, here's the value of the property. The bank says, awesome. Now we're going to give you a loan for 80% of that value. So what they do is they give you a loan for that 80% that you go ahead and take and pay off people. And sometimes you can keep some money. It's usually tax free or it's always tax free because it's debt. So anyways, they give you that check. So what you do to try to ensure that the property is going to appraise for what you need to appraise for is you meet the appraiser out there. Yes, this takes time. You might have to call off work or call a half day or call in sick if you have a job, whatever it is, meet the appraiser out at the property. You're gonna put a name to the face. They're gonna see you, they're gonna meet you, they're gonna talk to you, they're gonna ask you questions and you're gonna give them a little packet. And in that packet, it's going to be everything you did to the property, how much money you put into it, what you think it's worth, along with some comparable sales. Now, are they going to use those sales? Maybe, probably not actually. However, they are going to see that and see those numbers. And you're going to tell them what you think it's worth and what you have in it and why you need what you need. Mr. or Mrs. Appraiser, you know, I bought this property for 50,000. I put, you know, 30,000 into it. And then here's why, here's everything I did to it. Here's the comps that show that it's worth 100,000. So I really need this $80,000 so I can pay off my initial lenders, you know, get them paid off so I don't have to come out of pocket at all. Cause you know, you can say, I don't have the money to come out of pocket. You can take that approach or you can just simply give them the packet and kind of just talk about the deal. Regardless, the fact that you're telling them what you did do it, you're telling them what you need for it. You're telling them why you need it and then you're meeting them in person and shaking their hand goes a long way. They're gonna try not to be biased and they're usually pretty good about it, but the fact that they've met you and talked to you and that you're a nice, charming lady or gentleman, that will be in the back of their mind when they're giving that final appraised value to the bank. 
every single time I have met the appraiser at a property, I have got the appraised value that I've needed. And most of the time I was able to pull a little bit of money out. Almost every single time I have not met the appraiser out the property, it's came in right where I need to be or slightly less, usually not a ton less, but sometimes slightly less because they don't want to put their neck out there and give a inflated value or even give market value. If they don't have to, it's just easier on them to not you know, kind of push the market and show these high appraised numbers and push the market up. So the fact that they're meeting you they're willing to probably stretch that number a little bit or not stretch it, maybe just be more realistic with it. But if they don't see you and talk to you, they're probably gonna do the bare minimum and give that lower appraised value. So meet them and you will probably get what you need. Don't meet them, you might get what you need, but you might not. All right, I'm gonna tell you Maisie's joke of the day, gonna pull it off my phone here, and then I'm gonna tell you why debt to income doesn't really matter when it comes to this type of investing, so don't worry if you don't make a ton of money. I'm in $25 million worth of debt. I do well for myself, but my debt to income ratio would not qualify me, but that doesn't really matter when it comes to investment properties. If April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? Pilgrims, get it? You can use like corny, low muted laughter or like a golf clap. <laughs> okay, so here's why debt to income does not matter. Debt to income is based for residential loans based on how much income you make. When you're dealing with investment properties, you're dealing with these small local banks and you're dealing with good debt and you're dealing with, what did I say? Investment properties, not a mortgage or a car loan or something that doesn't produce income. Banks know that this property produces income. So instead of DTI or debt to income, they look at debt service coverage ratio or DSCR. For simplicity purposes, that basically just means the income or cash flow that that property brings in through rent is enough to cover the debt. So if the debt on this property is $500, the bank only cares that you're making a certain percentage above that, so you're paying them. They'll look at your personal credit score, they'll look at your personal income, but they're not gonna care if you're making 50 grand or 500 grand. If you're making money on the side and the property that you're buying more than enough covers the debt that is going to be on that property, then they're gonna be okay with it. So they look at the property and the cash flow that it produces much more than they look at your personal income and what you make. So I really focus on the refinance part of the Burrs method, but if you wanna see an entire Burrs deal before and after pictures of me in a property, showing you the rehab, showing you the refinance, showing you how it all works and cash flow, check out this video where I talk about and am in a real life example house and a real Burrs case study. See you on the next one.